These are the ideas that I'm encouraging us as a class to really embrace when we look at writers that we study and the history you know, from which these writers evolved. What I want to do mostly in this session is to, um, is to illustrate why questioning what we've been taught as fact is a helpful part of understanding the history of the work itself. There's nothing wrong with asking, really? He wrote that? She wrote that? Really? How do, how do we know? Okay? So what I want to ask the class right now, what difference does it make, if any, if someone other than the man William Shakespeare wrote the works? It was suspected someone else had written his entire work and not by William Shakespeare, and I think it's known why. Well, there's actually many, many, many candidates in what we call the authorship question, which is the assumption that the works, the canon of the Shakespeare canon, was actually written by someone other than the man, William Shakespeare. Nobody in all of this debate, nobody is saying that William Shakespeare didn't exist. But what we're saying is, is that there are, if you would pass that around, you will see for yourself, I'm gonna keep one, which I have, you will see a list of candidates for what we call candidates in the Shakespeare authorship question, or the authorship question. And what you're going to see here, you can look down this list and look for, for the people that you're referring to. I'm not sure that I've actually heard Lord Byron. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard Lord Byron, but you might be confusing um, the Earl of Oxford. Earl of Oxford, yeah. Which, yeah, which, um, excuse me, let me just, uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, yeah, I, I also knew that uh, Chris Marlowe was one of Christopher Marlowe is a very popular candidate in the authorship question. Now, if you look on this slide, if you see there are 10 traits, or as we would call, you know, um, qualifications to be the author of the world's greatest literary canon written in the English language. Evidence of education, record of correspondence, evidence of having been paid to write. You can go through this list on your own if you like. And then when you match it, when you go across and you look at the candidates, there is, um, it's pretty amazing how much evidence exists for other writers to have had these, you know, certain, you know, uh, what would you say, uh, evidence of authorship. It's pretty amazing, you know? And in fact, the person that we have the least amount of evidence for having written the canon is William Shakespeare. It is the least. I am not here to convince you. I am not here to try to persuade you in one way or the other. <laughs> I'm talking to a jury. I'm simply putting forward the fact that um, it's really good to question based on fact, like where a writer comes from, what you know, what qualifications would make that writer, you know, how does the writer live up to the work, etc. But questioning William Shakespeare seems to be this like daunting, like blasphemy. How dare you? And all I'm saying is, if we have this much evidence for other people, other persons to have been the author, why don't we just look at them? Why don't we just look, do it? William Shakespeare is the most researched, researched subject in the world. In the world. What if we put some of that energy into other candidates who are, by definition, more likely, based on evidence, to have written the works? What would that mean if we just started putting energy in this other, in this other arena? So, what, what I want to show you is, I come from a school of thought which is the latest candidate in the Shakespeare authorship question. And this has been a project very near and dear to my heart. I've been involved in it for 10 years. And what I'm going to pass out right now is a press packet. And I'm going to let you know that Sweet Swan of Avon did a woman write Shakespeare. This is perhaps one of the most exciting things that I've ever, ever been involved with. And what I want to do is get your initial reaction. What would that mean? What would that mean if we could prove a woman wrote the works of Shakespeare? Wow. <laughs> wow? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's what I'm saying. Because first, you know, and again, I am not here to convince you. 
I'm simply putting forth that there is a new candidate, which is Mary Sidney, Mary Sidney Herbert, the Countess of Pembroke. And when we go through some of the, um, this is a book that documents uh, the research that my friend has done and has become an official candidate in the authorship question. We have presented in England at the Globe Theater. And this is a really, really amazing thing. And in our project, you will see that the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, a wealth of other media have covered, or at least mentioned, the fact that this new candidate exists. And all I'm saying is, we tell women every day, simply by the fact that we say that William Shakespeare wrote the words, even though we can't prove it, we tell women that they're not capable of writing the greatest works written in the English language. I ask, and I would love your feedback, what would it mean to women today to simply know that it might be possible that a woman wrote the greatest works written in the English language? What would that mean in the dynamics of academia? I have time at the period in which William Shakespeare's play was out, I, I don't believe that women were in a, in, a, in a position to say, like, they were well read. And, I mean, they did read, but most of uh, Jane Austen's time kind of thing would be more. Uh, you know, a romance kind of stories and not actual serious politically inclined uh, points. Okay. So it's, I might be wrong. But what is your, you said wow earlier, what's your reaction to because knowing now? I mean, did anybody, has anybody heard of Mary Sidney? She is considered the second most educated woman, only to that of uh, Queen Elizabeth during her time. And we don't, we're not even, at least I can speak for me, wasn't even taught anything about Mary Sidney. She is one of the most fascinating literary figures in history. And we, we eclipse over her, we don't even study her. She had the Wilton Circle writing with all of the Ben Johnson, all of these literary figures. An amazing, well, an amazing library with women at that time. Do you, do you know what was the problem, like why a woman is not cons even remotely considered? It's like it's totally, socially it's not considered as anything to have uh, uh, an intelligent and educated woman. So it's like there is a set norm for how the woman behaved around that time. And I have a question. Is, is she anyway related to Philip Sidney? So she okay. is Philip. Oh yeah. my God, I love it. <laughs> she's Philip. She's Philip Sidney's uh, brother, sister. She and when Philip Sidney was a famous poet, and again, I have given all of you enough information that you can look up everything that we're talking about, make your own opinions. So if I gloss over something quickly, it's just because I want to be sensitive to our time. But Sir Philip Sidney was a tremendously famous poet. He died at age 30, a war injury to his leg, actually. And she, his goal was to write the greatest works in the English language. He was well on his way. He died prematurely. Mary Sidney picked up that commitment. You know, so right there, there's this motivation. Like, she had, she had declared her efforts to do this. And she went about to the extent that was possible during the, at the time. She couldn't write licentious body, you know, plays. That would be unheard of. We don't even understand that there wasn't even a law against it. It was unfathomable for a woman of the aristocracy to write plays. Unthinkable. She could translate, which she did, in French, Latin, and Italian, the three languages of which I referred to earlier that were required as part of the sources for Shakespeare. She could do this, but she couldn't write plays. Her son ended up, uh, William Herbert, ended up being Lord Chamberlain of England, he be, who is one of the most important positions that controls all the literary access and presses and publishing of the day, everything. So if it were known that his mother was writing such scandalous works, it's not just she would be banned. The entire family would be blacklisted. We don't have much of a comprehension of what that means in our society today about you know, the aristocracy, but you're out, and your whole family is out. So he would have to do everything in his power 
to protect anyone from knowing about her work. So, that being said, I'm, I'm here to introduce you to Mary Sidney, to, to pique your interest and to inspire, you know, hopefully that you will take this a dialogue that you can have with each other, you can have with other people, but um, if you're interested in learning more about the actual, you know, some of the facts that go with it, it's amazing how her life even parallels like the sonnets, even up until the point where they're, they're considered the, um, the progeny plays or sonnets where the, the author is begging the younger person to you know, have children get married. And it was at the point of Sir Philip Sidney's death that those plays stopped, those sonnets stopped with the plea to, to marry. Very interesting stuff. I'm not saying that it's proof positive, but all of the things collectively put together are so fascinating. And uh, I think it makes for a really interesting questioning of, of literature, you know, in, in, in our society. What I want to do, I want to play a short video, and I just want to give you a further flavoring of what we just discussed. I am here after class. If you guys want, you know, <laughs> I will show you the website. I will give you a book. I will do whatever it takes to just to show you that there's 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 more going on here than any of us are taught in school. I guarantee it. If we went to school in America, we're not taught this. And scholars today, for the most part, do not want to talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> Lights, please. Entire city built on a lie. <laughs> <laughs> 